Advent series. Jesus was called Emmanuel, which means God with us. So each week we've been unpacking what it means for God to be with us. In the first two weeks, we focus on how God is with us, and that brings hope and that brings love. Today we're going to focus on joy. You have nine more days until Christmas, so you have nine more days to find that perfect gift for your loved ones. And if you buy the wrong gift, then what happens? You end up standing in a long line on December 26th trying to return your gifts. Have you ever thought about the wise men and the gifts that they brought to Jesus? The Bible says they brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. This cartoon tells us that they got it wrong the first time, and they had to return one of their gifts. Can you imagine standing in line to return Frankenstein? So when God sent Jesus to this earth to save us from our sins, it's as if he was sending the perfect gift that everyone needed. In Luke 2, it says, The angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. So when you read that scripture, what phrase jumps out at you? To me, it's the phrase, great joy for all the people. God did not send Jesus to save just me or people just like me. He sent Jesus as a gift that would bring joy to all the people, every nation, every tribe, every tongue. Let's always remember that. Today we're going to look at some important things to remember about joy. First, God's plan for all of his children is to have joy forever. When God adopts us into his family, he wants us to have joy forever. He wants us to look forward to heaven because heaven is going to be this place beyond our wildest imagination. 1 Corinthians 2.9 says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. The Apostle Paul is telling us, you can't imagine what God has prepared for you. You can just try to picture some of the best things that you can imagine, and then know that it's going to go way beyond anything you can imagine. In Revelation 21, it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, they will be his people, God himself will be with them. And he will wipe every tear from their eyes, there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. So just picture that. It's going to be beyond your wildest imagination. Heaven's this beautiful place, no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain. God's plan for all of his children is to have joy forever. And sometimes you find yourself longing for heaven, and you get tired of waiting for heaven. But it'll be worth the wait. One reason why some people struggle to find joy is because they're always grabbing for joy instead of waiting for it. They're looking for a quick emotional high rather than looking for something that's eternal. You know, maybe if I just go out and buy a bunch of things for myself, that would bring joy into my life. You might get a brief emotional high, but then it wears off. Joy is worth waiting for. Joy is worth waiting for. The second thing we need to remember about joy is this. Joy can be experienced here and now. When you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're adopted into his family, and you experience immediate joy. God promises us that he'll never leave us or forsake us. He promises us that nothing will ever separate us from his love. We find joy when we focus on those promises of God. And the Bible says that when you become a Christian, you're given the gift of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, Peter had been preaching to a crowd of people, and it says this in verse 37, Peter's words pierced their hearts, and they said to him and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Each of you must repent of your sins, turn to God, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So there's a gift that he wants to give us, and it's going to bring joy into our life. 2 Corinthians 5, the Apostle Paul tells us more about the Holy Spirit. He says, you know, while we live in these earthly bodies, we groan and we sigh, but it's not that we want to die and get rid of these bodies that clothe us. Rather, we want to put on our new bodies so these dying bodies will be swallowed up by life. God himself has prepared us for this, and as a guarantee, he has given us his Holy Spirit. 
Craig Keener said, The Spirit is promised for the future age, but through Him we can taste God's presence and power in our lives in the present. And that's why Paul speaks of the Spirit as the down payment or the guarantee of our future inheritance. That word was used in ancient business documents for the first installment. So by experiencing the Spirit, we're experiencing a foretaste of the glories of the coming world in God's presence. I just love the image of that, of that word. It's like God is giving us the Holy Spirit, and it's this down payment that guarantees your future inheritance. Verse 5 in the message paraphrase says, The Spirit of God whets our appetite by giving us a taste of what's ahead. He puts a little of heaven in our hearts so that we'll never settle for less. I love that paraphrase. He puts a little of heaven in our hearts so that we'll never settle for less. Just think about that. Our world offers so many cheap substitutes for joy. Try this, you'll find joy. Try this other thing, you'll find joy. They tell us that joy will be found in a big bank account, or you'll find it in a really busy social calendar, or on your next big vacation. We should never settle for the lesser things this world has to offer. The Apostle Paul says that God has given us the Holy Spirit as a down payment. We get to taste this joy that's waiting for us in heaven, so we should never, never, never settle for the lesser things here on this earth. And then the third thing to remember is this. We live in a world with an enemy that tries to steal our joy. Satan is always trying to steal joy from us, and he has his strategy to accomplish it. He wants to tempt you with the things that this world has to offer. Listen to these words from 1 John. Do not love the world nor the things it offers you, for when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave, but anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. So Satan wants us to believe that we can be happy if we get enough things. And we can be happy if we become popular enough. He wants us to think we can be happy if we can experience enough physical pleasure. And if Satan gets us chasing after all those things, then we won't really focus on the things that really matter in life. So Satan is our enemy. He's going to accuse us. He'll tempt us. He'll try to distract us. Jesus said this in John 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that you may have life and have it abundantly. So we've looked at some important things about joy, but that leads me to a really big question. And the question is this, how can we maintain our joy when life gets hard? Isn't that the million-dollar question? We're all going to encounter times in life when life gets really, really hard. How do we maintain joy when life gets hard? And as I thought about that question, I found this passage of Scripture in the book of Hebrews that was really helpful. And we need to remember that life was really, really hard for these early believers. So how did they maintain their joy when life got hard? Hebrews 10 says, Recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison. You joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. So let's look closely at that scripture. It says, recall the former days when after you enlightened. So that refers back to when these people became followers of Christ. They were giving up everything the world had. They said, I'm going to follow Jesus Christ. After you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, sometimes being partners with those who were so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison. So picture this first group of believers that are thrown in jail, but they didn't get all of them. So if you didn't get thrown in jail during the first wave of persecution, then what are you going to do now? Are you going to just sit at home and watch TV? Are you going to go show some sympathy for those prisoners, your brothers and sisters in Christ who are in jail? We need to remember prisons in those days were not places that had air conditioning and TV and food. Prisons were pits with no food unless someone brought it to the prisoners. And nobody in those days was feeding prisoners except their relatives. 
Put, so put yourself in the early Christian's place. What are you going to do with your friends in jail now? If they find out that you're a Christian, they might throw you in jail too. But your brothers and sisters in Christ are suffering in jail. So you have to do something for them. So they chose to go show compassion to those in prison. Then what happened? Verse 34, And you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. So we can't really tell from the text if this was the official confiscation of their property or if it's just vandalism. Either way, their property was ruined and taken. So picture yourself in this small group of believers. Half of your small group went to jail. And then the other half has this meeting, and, and you pray, and you make this decision about showing costly love. So you say, you know what, we're going to go and we're going to minister those, to those people in prison. And while you're gone, people go to your house and they spray paint, Christians, go home. They spray that all over your house. They take your furniture. They burn it in the streets. And when you get back home, you see what's happened. What do you do? You gather your small group together in a circle and you sing a song of joy, praising God that you've been counted worthy of being persecuted for his name. That's what they did. Verse 34 says, they joyfully accepted the plundering of their property. How in the world can they respond with such joy? Well, we see how they're able to do this when you look at the next phrase, and this is so important. You knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. So losing their earthly possessions didn't bother them because they had a better possession and an abiding one. When you know that you have a better possession and one that lasts forever, then you're not paralyzed by anger when you lose something. So what is this possession that's a better possession, a better possession and an abiding possession? Our true possession is fellowship with God. It's being accepted by God, being loved by God, being embraced by the Father, and it's so much better than anything this world has to offer. David said it in Psalm 16, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So as long as God has promised to never leave me, I have a possession that is so much better than anything this world has to offer. The early believers could have joy in the midst of suffering because they had a treasure that was better than anything this world had. In God's presence, there's fullness of joy. Parents, let me say this. One of the best lessons you can teach your kids is teaching them how to maintain joy when life gets hard. The day is going to come when life gets really hard for all of us. So how can we still be joyful? How can we still be joyful? How could the Apostle Paul be sitting in a jail and write the words, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Well, he could do that because he knew he wasn't alone in that jail cell. God was with him. He had joy from God's presence with him in jail. He knew that he would have joy in God's presence in heaven for all of eternity. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. I think that's the key to keeping your joy. Later in the book of Hebrews, we'll see that the key to joy is fixing our eyes on Jesus. Look at Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has put before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he's seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. So Jesus shows us how joy can be such a great motivator. How could Jesus endure the cross with all the suffering and the shame and the rejection and the torture? Verse 2 says he was able to endure the cross because of the joy that was awaiting him. Joy can motivate us to remain faithful as well. What we believe about our future controls how we experience our present. Don't forget that. What we believe about our future 
controls how we experience our present. I like this story that Tim Keller told. He said, imagine you have two women of the same age, the same educational level, and even the same temperament. You hire both of them and say to each one of them, you are part of an assembly line, and I want you to take part A and put it in the slot B and then hand what you have assembled to someone else. And I want you to do that over and over again for eight hours a day. You put them in identical rooms with identical lighting, identical temperature, identical ventilation. You give them the very same number of breaks in a day, and it's very boring work. Their conditions are the same in every way except for one important difference. You tell the first woman that at the end of the year, you will pay her $30,000. And you tell the second woman that at the end of the year, you will pay her $30 million. After a couple of weeks, the first woman will be saying, isn't this tedious work? Isn't it driving you insane? Aren't you thinking about quitting? And the second woman will say, no, I love this job. In fact, I whistle while I work. So what's going on? You have two human beings who are experiencing identical circumstances in radically different ways. What makes the difference? It's their, expect, it's their expectation of the future that is different. And that story is not intended to say that all we need is a good income. It does, however, show that what we believe about our future completely controls how we are experiencing our present. I like that story because it reminds me I can have joy today even in the midst of suffering if I focus on the joy of heaven that is waiting for me in the future. So as we end this message, I want to read Hebrews 12 to you again, but this time I want to read it from the message paraphrase. And I think this will bring a smile to your face. It says, Do you see what this means? All these pioneers who blazed the way, all these veterans cheering us on, it means we better get on with it. Strip down and start running and never quit. No extra spiritual fat, no parasitic sins. Keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race that we're in. Study how he did it. Because he never lost sight of where he was headed, that exhilarating finish in and with God, he could put up with anything along the way, cross, shame, whatever. And now he's there in the place of honor right alongside God. And when you find yourselves flagging in your faith, go over that story again, item by item. That long litany of hostility he plowed through, that'll shoot some adrenaline into your souls. Isn't that a good paraphrase? Keep your eyes on Jesus. So the last question I put on your outline is this. We've been talking about joy. What would bring tears of joy to your eyes? Think about that question. What would bring tears of joy to your eyes? And as you think about how you answer that question, I think it tells us about what we really treasure in life. What would bring tears of joy to your eyes? For me, I think of when a person gets baptized and gives their life to Jesus. It could be a teenager. It could be an older person. But there's tears of joy when a person steps across the line and says, you know what, I realize what God did for me and I'm going to follow him the rest of my life. That brings tears of joy because they have the presence of God and he's going to be with them forever. Or maybe I think of a person who comes up to me and says, you know, today I celebrate seven years of being sober. That would bring tears of joy to my eyes. Maybe addiction had a terrible grip on that person's life, but now the presence of Jesus is making a real difference, setting him free. I have tears of joy when I think about how God is working in his life, transforming his life. He's being set free, tears of joy. And then I think we can have tears of joy at a funeral. We sure have tears of sadness because we miss our loved one, but we can also have tears of joy when we think about them enjoying their eternal reward with Jesus. And maybe they had health problems the last few years of their life, but now we can picture them in heaven with resurrection bodies. No more pain, no more suffering. We have tears of joy as you think about a joyful reunion with your loved ones. Doesn't that tell us a lot about joy? 
So really, it's keep your eyes on Jesus. That's the source of joy. God promises to be with us today. He promises that nothing will separate us from his love. He promises there's this amazing joy that waits for us in heaven. That's motivation to endure. That's motivation to run the race. Let's pray and celebrate the joy that we have. Heavenly Father, thank you that Jesus came to this earth to bring joy today and joy forever in heaven. We can't praise you enough. We can't thank you enough. So, Lord, we just celebrate your goodness. You are with us now. You are with us forever. Thank you for the promise. You will never leave us or forsake us. Jesus brought joy. He gives us joy today. He will give us joy in the future. We give you all praise and glory. Help us to share this joy now with people who need to hear it. In Jesus' name, amen.